Good morning. Grateful that we can worship the Lord together. Get a little, get a little walk-up music. That's kind of nice. Kind of nice. Grateful to have some guests with us today. The fielders are with us today, and you'll be hearing from them in a few moments as we talk about the Lord's work to our mission work together. Um, fall is here, and uh, grateful to have the sweater vest has made a reappearance. So that's good. Feel like I'm back in my element, so that's good. Nice and cozy. That's right, my brother. That's right. As we begin our worship, I'm reminded of Psalm 105. Here's what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. That's what we've come to today, to rejoice in the Lord. Grateful that you've joined us today, and let's begin with prayer. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for Jesus who died that we might have life. We're reminded that as we meet this first day of the week, that it's a reminder that Jesus' tomb is empty, that Jesus is to us our Savior, our Lord, our King, that he's not just merely a great example to us or a great teacher. He is the Lord who saves us from our sins. And today we come to worship him in spirit and in truth. We pray that you guide us by your spirit. We're grateful that we can talk today about your work among the nations and how we're involved in that and how we need to invest in that and be involved in that. We're grateful for friends that have gathered uh, with us, Lord, family, that we can come uh, around your word and to hear from you and to do as these, as this psalm says, to reflect on your wondrous deeds and how great you are. Guide us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And now the Zach Brown Band. Hey, if you could stand and join me. Um, I don't know if you've seen the announcement slides that we've been kind of putting up before service, but um, I've been adding a, a slide for a, a missionary each week um, as part of the, the Baptist Co-op uh, program. And something that I've noticed about these missionaries um, as I've looked week to week is that uh, a lot of them work here in America. I don't know if you realize this or not, but America is a mission field, a very large one. And there are missionaries that are that are serving in numerous places, reaching out to the lost. And this Friday night, in this little field over here, weather permitting, is a mission field. And it's right here on our own lawn. So um, I just wanted to bring that to mind because I really need your prayers uh, about that. We're carefully considering what to do as follow-up with with some of these students. Uh, We really want to be faithful to the opportunity that God has has given us to speak into their lives. So if you could be praying about that, that would be great, because we really do want to uh, reach out to to these students. It is a vast mission field. Do you agree? Well, yes. So please, please pray. And we know that that we have hope, and we have a message of mercy, you know, that, that we share with them. His mercy is more. That's what we're starting off with this morning. More wonderful than we can imagine. We need to share that. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
see our need for more of you and just to acknowledge in our hearts that you reign. You reign from eternity past, you reign currently, and you will continue to reign forever and ever and ever. Lord, we, we come to you this morning in humble hearts and ask that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Excited to uh, announce our guest this morning. Uh, Tammy Fielder is here with us today, and her husband Brock, uh, all the way from Gretna, uh, to come share with uh, about her experiences with Operations Christmas Child and Shoeboxes. Um, I've known Tammy for probably about 20 years uh, through uh, different things with VDOT back in my days in Lynchburg. Uh, worked with her more uh, closely on some contracts here the past five, six years. As you can imagine, it takes a whole contract to help keep me straight at work. Uh, so that's a big task, and Tammy is a big part of that. Uh, so over the course of time, being Facebook friends and things like that, understand her involvement with uh, Operation Christmas Child, and she's had some great experiences in uh, working with uh, this group and uh, handing these boxes out in Uganda and Ukraine. So I uh, know today we will be blessed by the message she has today and hope that you are inspired to take home some shoe boxes with you. So Tammy, come on up. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today and share about the two distributions. Um, it was just such a blessing to be able to go um, both to Uganda in 2013 and Ukraine in 2018. Um, I've got a few pictures for you to share. Next slide. This one, um, this church was built for us to give out shoeboxes. I don't know if you know, as a church, when you're packing a shoebox, you're um, helping your neighbor, you're giving them the gospel, you're giving them a gift. But did you know you're building churches too? This church was built for us the week before when we got to um, Uganda. And my husband would describe this as a pole barn. Any farmers in the house? <laughs> so, um, so it's not a fancy church. Nothing is nearly as elaborate as yours or my church. But um, nevertheless, a church for them to come home to on Sundays and Wednesday nights to um, learn more about the gospel. So the children were presented the gospel, but the pastor in this church he worked with a local landowner to have this church built. And um, 
One of the things this picture reminds me is that um, I'm the oldest of six children. Anybody here got a large family? Large families? Yes. So um, the pastor in this um, community, he was told ahead of time that he would, give, he would be given shoeboxes to give out. Um, he didn't know exactly how many because we packed different size shoeboxes. He was told how many cartons. So he was told they're about to expect so many. So he would go into the homes of these family, um, family members, and he would talk to the mom and father of the household, and he would say, if you have four, five, or six children, you can invite two. If you have one, two, or three children, you can invite one. I thought about that a lot when I came home from Uganda, because I'm like, my parents had six. My husband's parents had eight. Who would they have invited? So, next slide. This slide is in Ukraine, and this is in a school. It's actually in a gymnasium. And the thing that I wanted you to see in this, um, when your child gets a shoebox, they get a gift, and it's great that you give them a gift, and we're so excited for them to get a gift. But they also get a gospel track. It's called The Greatest Gift of All that tells them the story of salvation with every shoebox. And in Uganda, you saw the difference when they were presenting them. You see here, the teachers, when they're trained, they have these lovely posters. So as you give your $9 for shipping, more and more Operation Christmas Child is, ma is maximizing the effect for that shipping money. So it doesn't only just ship that box. It prints this greatest gift of all booklet. It prints the teacher materials for the children's teachers to teach them the gospel. And it prints those lovely posters for them to be able to learn more and more. Um, next slide. This was one of the hardest pictures in Ukraine. And in Uganda, and um, when I went to Uganda in 2013, my youngest, my oldest granddaughter was two years old. And um, when we presented the gospel both times, what happens is we pass out the shoeboxes closed. This greatest gift of all booklet is laying on top. Most of the time, we're not there to give out the shoeboxes. It's just local partners in those countries in over 120 plus countries around the world. And the children sit and hold that box closed with this book laying on top. Can you just imagine the children sitting there holding that while they're hearing the gospel? But they do. They hold it closed. And um, after they present the gospel, then there's a countdown. It's three, two, one, and the children open the boxes. And so what you see on the ground inside of that church that had been there maybe 25, 30 years, this might, might be what you think of as an old white frame house gutted on the inside, but it was a church for them. Um, Inside is the children having the party after they received the shoebox. And it was a joyous time. But the hardest part for me was to look at the door. Because when I looked at the door, I saw the officer. And on the left, I see the children stacked on top of each other. But what you don't see in the sunlight that I remember just as vividly as yesterday um, was the parents holding those children the same age as Emma. And um, hard to think about that... Um, as hard as I work and as many shoeboxes as I pack and as much as I talk to you and I ask you, please pack another shoebox. Please pray that if you could give up something, like for me, be sweet tea, something for a week that you might consider packing another shoebox, that you could reach another one of these children because they may get invited back to another distribution. They may not. Their friends may learn a lot about the gospel and share with them. They may not. So it's really, really important for you to pack another shoebox, if you can, to reach another child. Next slide. This one um, reminds me that um, it's just so much more. Um, Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, we don't build churches. We reach children with the gospel. But we partner with other churches and other organizations that build churches. This church was built the year before we were there. And in the front, it looks like your church. It's just a beautiful church on the outside. In the back, it's not like my church and your church. There's an orphanage in the back. So when you built, when you packed your shoeboxes to go to this church, you helped build an orphanage for 16 boys and 16 girls. Anybody signing up for eight boys in one bedroom in your house? <laughs> not me. I had two, and that was a handful. But in these rooms, they had, at the bottom of the steps, was the two rooms for the 16 boys. And at the top of the steps was the two rooms for the 16 girls. So you packed a shoebox, you, you gave the gospel, and it was enough. But God multiplied it and gave them a church and an orphanage, a place to live, and a home. A self-supporting orphanage on that church grounds, they have 
things that they grow to feed those children run off from the roof to have, provide water for those children. Just such an awesome opportunity. Next slide. Um, this one reminds me that um, when you think of your child, you might want to consider a personal note. I'm not as faithful to do that, but the children love that. The child on the left was in Ukraine when I was there, and she received a shoebox from Virginia when I was there. What are the chances that I would come back and talk to a church that's packed for over 20 years to let them know I met the child that received their shoebox? They had never heard back from one of their letters or one of their shoeboxes. But God can do that. He can make it so that I can give that personal moment to that church. Next slide. This one, um, it's harder for me to say. My kids didn't care anything about school. They didn't. My boys were very technical minded. They work with their hands and they love to work with their hands. They didn't care a thing about school. And school, here's guaranteed. We get to go to school no matter what. If you notice in his hand, he's got the death grip on those pencils. The reason he has the death grip is because he's passed by all the toys and all the fun things, all the things that I thought God intended for me to pack in that shoebox. And I'm like, why? Why are you so intent on the pencils? You have a car, you have all these fun things. He said, pencils allow me to go to school. Here, we think of so many things that we need to go to school. He needs paper, he needs pencils, maybe an ink pen, maybe crayons. So if God puts on your heart to put school supplies in there, please do, because a lot of times you're giving a child an opportunity to come out of his situation with the gospel and with school supplies so he could go to school and better himself. Next slide. This one um, just reminds me that whether you're packing a wow well item or whatever, you just need to pray and pack because God knows what that child needs to get through their situation to be able to know he is who he is. So if God puts on your heart to put that girl item in the boy box, pray and pack it. If God puts on your heart to put that boy item in the girl box, you don't know if he's trying to reach do something for his mom or his dad or his brother or sister. You don't know if he needs that thing just to secure his faith. I heard from Shemaya at a, an event not long ago, and um, he lost his father at five. His father was a pastor. His life changed drastically. And he kept telling his mom, you know, the other children have all these things from their fathers, but I want a car. I just want a car. And um, in his shoebox, his mom had told him, just pray to your heavenly father. He will give you the desires of your heart. And when he got his shoebox, only shoebox he'd ever got in his life, he got a car. It's such a simple thing to us, but such a big thing to him. Next slide. This one is um, at the same distribution as the one that was so powerful for me for Emma. But this one was powerful to my team members because this one reminded my team members that we've got children that will lay with their head in the mud. It had rained all night the night before breathing gas fumes from the generator that runs the light and the sound system inside that church just so that he can hear what's going on. Would we be so faithful to try to hear something about the gospel that we would lay our head in the mud, stick our head through a hole in the wall trying to hear what's going on? Next slide. And this one is the greatest journey. Um, I'm not here to sell you on the greatest journey. I'm here to tell you that the greatest journey is a discipleship program that comes after the shoebox. Nine dollars pays for the shipping, it pays for the teaching materials, it pays for so many things, the tariffs and stuff to get in those countries, it, pray, it pays for this booklet to be printed in country. But The Greatest Journey is a 12 le lesson discipleship program and um, my most favorite thing of The Greatest Journey is it says, in one of the activities, it says, name nine people you want to tell about your friend Jesus. And um, so there's the multiplication factor in it. The other thing is they're taught lessons, they're taught by games, they're taught by activities so that they can learn more. Now the pastors would tell you in those countries that their favorite thing about the greatest gift of all and the greatest journey, and they don't dis dis um, discriminate between the two, is that in those countries where they don't have much written word, this gives them Sunday school and vacation Bible school material for them to teach their children more and more about the gospel. If they complete the 12 lesson discipleship program, they get a New Testament in their own language. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I went through that very quickly, but I wanted you to be able to hear as much about the ministry as possible. Um, I'll be here afterwards if you have questions, but thank you so much. Amen.
outstanding. Thank you, Tammy, so much. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And as you turn there, let's pray. Lord, we now open our Bibles. We pray that you open our hearts, Lord, to receive the truth. I pray personally right now for the ministry of Samaritan's Purse and for the shoebox ministry. I'm grateful for Tammy and her husband, Brock, coming here today. And I pray that you bless them in their work. Lord, give them fruit for their labor, we pray. We also pray for our own ministry through this uh, opportunity that we have so that uh, boys and girls, men and women, would come to know you. That's our great desire. And as we open your word, we pray that you'd help us to see the motivation behind it, of why we would be involved in this ministry and many others. Lord, help us to have a heart for you and a heart for others, because ultimately loving you means that we love other people. Guide us through your word, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, down in verse 7, is our text for today. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version translation, but you can follow along on whatever translation that you have with you. It says, beginning in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love of God that God has for us, God is love and whoever abides abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him whoever loves God must also love his brother these verses really point out to us our motivation and the truth behind much of what we do as a church as families and as individuals ultimately we're called to love our Neighbor, This is what we believe. The past several weeks we've been talking about things that we believe. And here is a belief that's not only rooted in our history, it's also an aspiration that we have. That this would be, this would mark us, that we would be marked by love. Several years ago I read someone who defined missions. Because sometimes there's a confusion about what missions is. And I think this is an excellent definition to give us an understanding of why it is we do what we do, especially with regard to missions. This person wrote that missions is the strategic and conscious effort to eliminate pain and sorrow in all forms, especially and including the pain and sorrow of hell. Missions is all about making a difference in the lives of others, to eliminate pain and sorrow through a strategy, through a conscious effort, through actions that we take to eliminate sorrow, especially the ultimate sorrow and the ultimate pain and that separation from God forever in a terrible place called hell. You see, missionaries are called to go to people who haven't heard yet, people who haven't been reached. 
Sometimes when we think about our church and the purpose of our church, we need to understand that our motivation as a people is not just to serve those who are already here. One reason that God has tarried in his sending his son back is the fact that we exist not just for those that are already here, but those who aren't here yet. Not just for those who have already been reached for Jesus, but those who haven't been reached yet. Jesus even asked, even was one time asked about who is our neighbor. You'll remember in Luke's uh, Gospel, chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. We considered it before. And in the process of answering this person's question, who is my neighbor? Of course, the person that came to him was coming with a uh, with an agenda on their own mind, they were asking, Lord, who is my neighbor? Because they wanted to figure out who they could leave off the list. And, and we probably shouldn't be that kind of people ourselves. But Jesus answers his question in Luke 10 by telling them a story, the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know the point of that parable, the point of that story? The point of that story is that loving God means that we love other people. It sounds kind of familiar to what we just read, doesn't it? It's exactly what motivates us. Missions is loving our neighbor. Exactly what Tammy has been talking about us, talking to us about this morning. But when we talk about loving our neighbor, from where does this love come? And why should we love our neighbor? What does it mean to love? How can we love our neighbor? This passage answers each of these questions very, very clearly. First of all, we see in these verses the origin of of Christian love. You see it in verse 7 down to verse 10. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. It is evidence of God's work in our life if we love other people. If we only have love for ourselves and those that we care about, it's not a reflection of God's love. He goes on to say, anyone who does not Love does not know God because God is love. It is a part of our characteristics. It's in our DNA when we become a follower of the Lord. Verse 9 says, in this, the love of God has been made manifest. That word made manifest is actually an idea of revealing something that beforehand had not been revealed before. You see, when we love other people, we're making manifest the love of God to others. You see, many times we have around us people who wonder what God is like. And God has placed us in this world as followers of him so that we can show people what God is like by loving other people. That's exactly what he's saying in verse 9. He says, God sent his, his only son, Jesus, into the world so that we might live through him. And in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, that's your 50 cent word for the day, okay, propitiation, all right? You can go home smarter today because I'm about to tell you what the word propitiation means. Propitiation means removing an offense. It means if, you have, if there's something between you and another person and it's based upon an offense that has taken place and you remove that offense, it's called propitiation. That thing that is between you two, that barrier, that wall, that brokenness has been taken away. On the other side of it, as the gospel tells us, that not only is salvation propitiation where the offense between us and God is taken away, but also the atonement takes place through Jesus and the atonement is when that thing that caused the offense is not just taken away, it's atoned for, it's made up for. And we find that both those things in Jesus. In Jesus, we have the offense that we have against God because of our own sin, not just our own, but also of, of all those that have gone before us, that stands between us and a holy God. It's taken away. That's what propitiation means. And on the other hand, the other side of that same coin of salvation is atonement, where that sin is atoned for, not because what we have done, it's because of what Jesus has done. You want to know what the gospel is about? It's not about what you do or what you choose or what aisle you walk or which church you join. The gospel is all about what Jesus has already done on your behalf and you saying, yes, that's for me. 
That's exactly what these verses are saying. It says the origin of Christian love is God himself. While we, Romans 5.8 says this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't something that we did to merit it. It wasn't something we did to earn it. It wasn't uh, something in us that, that made us worthy of it. It says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Us. You want to know my story? In June of 1980, what happened to me is God came looking for me because I, I certainly wasn't looking for him. In fact, I was in lots of other places that were far from him. But he came looking for me. That's exactly what these verses are saying. The origin of, of all Christian love is in God himself. He is expressing that love to us. You want to know what the gospel is all about? It's about God's love for us and ex expressed to us clearly through Jesus. And John is telling us that our encouragement to love other people, to obey, doesn't come because he's threatening us. Instead, he is inspiring us. It isn't as if we love other people because we're afraid what God will do to us. Instead, we're inspired by his love already for us. Being loved helps us to love other people. You see, when you begin to understand how deeply and how far that you are from the Lord when he comes to save you, the more deep your thankfulness is that he did come to save you. You see, love is not indulgence. It's not an acceptance of sin. Love is expressed clearly through what Jesus has done. And this love is a beautiful display. You know, children learn by observing. Did you know that? You know, when my kids were young, which was a few years ago, I remember thinking about certain behaviors that they would, uh, would do, and I wondered where they, they learned those from. And when they became a teenager, I realized, hey, wait a minute, I think they got that from me. We all learn by observation. You know what John's saying here? John is saying that the way that the world learns love is by watching those who are his children. People learn about love by watching us if we claim to follow the God who created us. So here's the question for today. What are they learning from you? What are they learning from you about your behavior and your love that you're expressing that you claim to have for God? How is it changing your life? You see, Christians who love others give evidence, John says, of being born again. That's what he says here. Whoever has been born of God knows God and displays his love to other people. Verse 7, he says... Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God. It's interesting how John says it. He says, someone who has been born of God, this is something that takes place in the past, but yet has a future effect. That's the kind of verb that's used here. It's speaking of the fact that what has happened in us in the past has an ongoing effect in us. I'll never forget the conversation I had with a missionary in a, another country far, far from here. And at the time, we were sitting on the edge of a village, a very poor village, and this particular individual had gone through great persecution and great difficulty. And as we were sitting there, we were sitting underneath some trees. The shade of those trees were wonderful in a hot day. And I asked this missionary, I said, what is it that really impacts you about your time here? And why do you sacrifice all that you do? He said, well, I think it's a little like these trees. And I looked around me and I thought, I, I think I'm missing it. Please explain. What do you mean? What about these trees? He said, well, you know, these trees were planted by missionaries who preceded me, who got the seeds from missionaries that preceded them. And you see, it was because those missionaries knew that someone would come behind them that they planted those seeds, 
the seeds of that tree, knowing that they probably would never sit under the shade of them, but yet here we are, and we're sitting under the shade of them. I think that's what John is saying here. He's saying that we plant the seeds of the gospel, ultimately not knowing what's going to happen, except that someone will sit in the shade of the truth that we share. Verse 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. He's speaking here of the fact that God, God it, it, he's not saying that God does loving things, and but that is true. And he's not saying that, uh, that God is loving. No, it's not just that. That is true. He's saying that everything that God does is out of love. Which reminds us, when we think of difficult things that we experience, Romans 8, verse 28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. In other words, everything that God does is loved, so therefore it is out of that love that He expresses so many things that happen in our lives. And sometimes it's a difficult love. You ever had children that were misbehaving? Oh, you had perfect children. Okay, all right. Which means that you probably weren't a perfect child. But you understand what I'm saying. Ultimately, God expresses his love for us in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes even in difficult situations. His punishment to remind us of going back to him. Sometimes difficulties that cause us to seek him. Sometimes his blessings that overflow in our lives that make us grateful and give us a heart of gratefulness and therefore we can be grateful before others. You see, when we begin to look upon that love, it transforms us. We give evidence of of God's love to other people. You see, when we begin to grasp, to get a grip on how much God loves us, it changes us. And that's exactly what John is saying. And he says the ultimate act of love is the gift of Jesus. Verse 9 and 10 says, In this the love of God was made manifest, was made clear among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And by implication that means that apart from him is not life but death. That's what John is, is getting at. Christ is... The unveiling of God's heart to show God's love for the world. You want to know what God is like? Go with me to see Jesus weeping over the tomb of Lazarus, his best friend who had died. Even though Jesus knows what he's about to do, his sorrow is for those that were weeping and mourning. And so he sorrows with us. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You want to know what God is like? Go with me to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there is Jesus at the point where he is about to be tried and murdered. And what does he say? Lord, not my will, but yours be done. That's a picture of what God's love is like. Why Why should we sacrifice and be involved in things like missions? It's because God loves us and it motivates us to love other people. We cannot have God's love within us and not be motivated externally to love other people. That's what he's saying. It's the origin of Christian love. Verse 11 points out It also inspires us. Verse 11 says, God's own love for us inspires us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The love of our Savior motivates us. It is energy within our life that motivates us. It's out of that love that we sacrifice and care for other people. It reminds me of of the little boy. His sister... Had a rare blood disease. And in the process needed a transfusion. And that transfusion needed to come from someone that would match her. Found out in testing that the little boy's blood would would work. And the little boy didn't completely understand the situation. He understood that his sister was dying and that she needed help. She needed a transfusion. And they came to him and said, would you be willing to to give some of your blood for her. And he paused for a minute. 
real quiet. His lip kind of quivered, and he said, okay, I will do that. So they put them on adjacent beds, and they had tubes in his arm and tubes in her arm, and they began to take some of his blood as a transfusion into his sister's arm, and he began to cry, and they said, what's wrong? He said, well, I, I just need to know how long will it take before I die? You see, he thought giving his blood to his sister meant that he was giving up his blood and he was perfectly willing to do that. And so he asked, so when do I die? It reminds me of kind of what Jesus did on the cross. He didn't do it because of what he had done wrong. He didn't do it just because he wanted to care about his particular family or his people group. He died for the sins of the world, for his children, so that we might live through him. That's what John is saying right here. Why we should love one another. Not only does God's own love for us uh, inspire us, but also God's own spirit in us. Verse 12 and 13, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. That love in us comes because the Holy Spirit moves us, impels us, motivates us. And that spirit makes a difference in us in such a way that we love and care for other people. It is, uh, I guess in some ways to say, it is a public display of God's love because of God's spirit in us displayed to other people. It reminds me of what I heard the little boy say one time when he watched a baptism take place. In fact, there was a little boy uh, when I pastored at Kedron who came up to me and, and said something very similar. He said, Pastor, uh, when do I get advertised? He thought that was baptism, that you get advertised. And the more I thought about that through the years, the more I realized, you know, that's, that's pretty accurate. You see, God's love is advertised through us in the way we live our lives. The power that's there. This is how we know we abide in him. That we care for other people. You want to know how you can have some assurance that God's love is in your life. It's when you care and minister to people who can't do anything to care and minister back to you. You make a difference in other people's lives and they can't pay you back. And you don't even think about that. That's kind of what they're saying here in these verses. That ultimately God's spirit in us makes all the difference in the world. Verse 14 through 16. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. He's speaking here of personal testimony. What is yours? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God. God abides in him and he in God. This again is our testimony. Not that we just merely walked an aisle and signed a card, but that God's Spirit lives within us and we testify to this truth. Verse 16, So we have come to know and to believe the love of th that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. The motivation for what we do is deep. The well of it is deep. But it does make a difference in our personal lives. Because it gives us peace, freedom from fear. Notice what he says in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. You see, one result of God's love in our life is we have assurance. We have Peace, we know that one day we will stand before the Lord. There will be a judgment day when everyone who has ever been created will stand before the God who created them and will have to give an account for every word and deed, every deed done and undone, every uh, word spoken and unspoken, merely thought. And we who have the love of God within us have the assurance of knowing that we can approach that throne with confidence because He has changed us. Experiencing and expressing the love of God is, is powerful. Knowing without a doubt that God in His Spirit resides in our lives results in unbounded confidence as we approach the day when we will meet our Maker. That's what it says in verse 17. Because He is 
so also are we in this world. Because of God's indwelling spirit, it makes a difference in us. Because he says in verse 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, if you're like most people, there's some fear in your life. Some things that you worry about. Some things that you're anxious about. We've talked about that many times in this room, in our times of worship. I'm here to remind you once more that ultimately the perfect love of God casts out fear. Because ultimately faith is the antidote to our fear. It is the way to get away from that because there's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love casts out fear. He says here, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected, matured in love. And we love, why, verse 19, because he first loved us. You see, God came seeking us. He took the initiative. He took the lead. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm here to remind you not only the origin of Christian love and the results of it, but also the command to love. Because he says in verse 20, if anyone says, I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. And he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. As we've talked about before, one reason that we do what we do as a church is not just for the purpose of serving one another. It's also to serve those who haven't been reached yet. To reach through the hands and the work of missionaries to others who haven't heard yet. To places that we may never be able to go to ourselves. Yet we do it out of love. Because we cannot say that we love God and not even care about other people and to be motivated to act on that love. One simple way that we do it is by packing a shoebox that most anybody can do. Most anybody. And it is a tool in the hands of faithful people so that others might hear about the love that we've been reading about this morning. Because I'm here to remind you also that our missionaries remind us of the fact that there are places in the world where you can journey for a long, long distance and not find any Christians and not find any churches and not have access to a Bible in their language and not to have churches that are there. We want to make a difference in that. And we are. But may that work be multiplied through the hands, of pe hands and feet of people like Samaritan's Purse and the Shoebox Project, but also through many other missionaries that we support, almost 5,000 international missionaries that we support as a Southern Baptist church, and the many thousands that are here in, in, in America that we've mentioned just a few moments ago. Why do we do that? Because God loves us, and he's expressed that love through Jesus, and because of that, it makes a difference in how we live our lives and that we might sacrifice that others might hear. You want to know what this church is to be about? It's to be about that. That we will be a lighthouse on this corner that doesn't just light Main Street or the cross streets here. Not just Salem, but around the world. And that only can that happen if it's the light of the gospel of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, for this day, we're very, very grateful. We're grateful for your word and for the encouragement of the truth, that fact that you do love us, that you do care for us, and that you do express that way, uh, love to us in, in ways that we can see, that we can experience, that we can touch and feel. Thank you for that. Thank you for sending Jesus who died that we might have life and that in his life, we have life. Lord, give us faith in his name. Give us the kind of love for you that also spills over into our love for other people. 
Give us wisdom to know that in the process of loving you that we're also to love other people and that it is out of the overflow of your care for us and your love for us that we love others. May we be willing to be others-centered in such a way that we would be a lighthouse of the gospel in our home, in our workplace, in our schools, in our community, that we will be a light for you, Lord, because you first shined your light upon our darkness and you set us free through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we come this morning, we're also mindful that there are There might even be some in this room who've heard about that love of God, but have never embraced it. There may be some in this room who've heard of Jesus and the gospel, but maybe for the first time they've understood that that gospel includes them and that Jesus died to save them from their sins. And maybe today they want to repent and believe, to repent of their sins and to turn back from the darkness in which They're walking and to turn to the light of Jesus, the light that sets us free. Lord, may that happen today. May that happen every day. But Lord, we also ask that you give us wisdom and courage to know how we can apply your truth to our life. And maybe today we need to take steps of faith that will be public. That will allow others to pray for us and to join us in that journey. We love you. We're grateful for Jesus. Give us courage to act on what you've told us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a closing song. And as our practice, if you have some type of decision to make, you're welcome to come. But if you'll sing along and if you have a decision to make, you're welcome to come. When I fear my faith will fail When the tempter would fail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, and he must hold me fast. Thank you all so much for coming today. Tammy, thanks so much for sharing about uh, God's work through your ministry. Yes, Mel? I mean, sorry. Sorry, nickname slipped out. I apologize. Build some shoe boxes today. All right. Brother Sean, very fearfully I say you have the floor. Hey, but I have another friend today, so that's good.
While you're signing up for that, you can sign up for Trunk or Treating in our Fall Festival uh, next Sunday. Uh, pizza is going to be provided. We need uh, volunteers to help with games, uh, trunk, uh, the Trunk or Treating. Um, we need some trunks out there, so uh, we need to uh, support that and have many volunteers out there to make it a, a nice event uh, for next Sunday, which will be Halloween. Uh, Melanie, thank you for plugging the shoe boxes. Uh, they'll be out there as well. Um, Pastor Search Team, please be in prayer for them. We uh, handed out our second round of questionnaires to the team members today, so uh, we'll be reviewing those Tuesday night. So please be in prayer for the Search Team members as they uh, prayerfully read over those questionnaires as we start to get a number of uh, individuals, even smaller and smaller, as we start getting closer to maybe doing some phone interviews and face-to-face -face interviews here in the, in the several weeks. So please be in prayer for that. It's a pivotal time uh, as we start to uh, dwindle those numbers down. So last one I have, I think Donnie wanted to say something real quick. Thank you, Donnie. We'll definitely be continuing prayer for Carolyn's recovery. So, uh, with that, let's go to God in prayer conclude today. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this honor and privilege to be in your house here today to worship and glorify you. Father God, we just um, ever reminded today about your love, an amazing love that surpasses understanding at times. But Lord, we know that you. <clears throat> Sent your love here and your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Be raised three days later to complete the perfect plan, Lord. And uh, Father, may we just be reminded today as we go our separate ways and go into work or wherever we might be in our, in our travels, that may we just be the, the love of Christ to others. Uh, Father, whether it be through this church and helping out our members like Carolyn, Lord, that uh, have gone through surgery in times of need, Lord. Uh, well, Father, may we just be an impact in this community to reach the lost. Well, God, just uh, thank you for the love in this church. I thank you, Lord, for loving us and giving us your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a good week. Mm -hmm.